This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. I want to welcome everybody back to this week's episode of Crimes and Consequences. This is a story I didn't know about, and I don't think you know about no, it's Pauline a, Parker. It's a New Zealand case. Yeah, you know, I didn't think they did bad things in New Zealand. I know. Apparently, Every apparently crime is everywhere. Before I start, because this one's a doozy. I want to ask everybody to hit whatever button you got to hit to listen Please. to us more. Or just let people know you like us. Yeah. I don't care how you do it. <laughs> just, just do it. Just, just talk do to it. a friend. <laughs> so I told you, this is about Pauline Parker. She was born Pauline Reaper. Reaper? Yeah. And her friend, Juliet Hume. So let me start with Pauline, okay? Okay. Pauline was born in New Zealand to her parents, Herbert and Honora Reaper. Pauline, she grew up in a blue-collar, working-class family, just this normal family. Her father was the owner of a fish market. He did wholesale. And her mother ran a boarding house. Herbert, her dad, he was known as a very gentle soul. He smoked his pipe. He was very small in stature. And he was just like a nice guy. Honora she was a loving wife and mother. Like, there's nothing wrong with them. The two had four children together, and they had a common law marriage. So they weren't officially married. Yeah, now, like, at least in the state of Michigan, they don't allow that. No. But they had that, and I don't know how New Zealand works, but their oldest child was Wendy. In essence, she was what a good daughter would be back then. She didn't do anything wrong, and... They didn't really think she could do anything wrong. She was just like a good, you know, she was a good kid. Yeah, just a little different than I was at yeah. that age. <laughs> then there was Wendy's little sister, Pauline. She was a troublemaker of this very modest family. And the family always worried, since she was a little girl, what what is she going to grow up to be? That's not good. That's not good. There wasn't a lot of information about her other two siblings. As I told you, she was one of four. But it said that one child was considered, okay, to be a drooling imbecile. Yeah. That's not what we would say this. Yeah, I don't know how parts. appropriate that is. Yeah. And then I think this child had severe mental disabilities and ended up being locked away in a mental oh. institution, but it's not all that clear. The youngest child died shortly after being born. Oh. The baby had a congenital heart problem and basically was... I don't want to say born still, like born still born, but was known to the family as the blue baby. Oh, that is so sad. When Pauline was five years old, she got this bone infection. She was diagnosed with it and forced to spend months in the hospital over a three year span. And she had a lot of operations. I don't know exactly what the technical, scientific, medical term for a bone infection was. But I do know that she spent a lot of time in the hospital, had a lot of operations. So while all these other kids were outside laughing and playing with friends, she was forced to spend all her time in a hospital bed. Oh, that had to suck as a kid. And watch the kids from outside the window. She ended up walking with a limp for the rest of her life due to that condition. Now I'm going to talk to you about Juliet Hume. Unlike Pauline, she was born in England to her parents, Henry and Hilda. She was born into a very intellectual family. And she was the daughter of well-known, highly celebrated physicist. His name was Dr. Henry Rainsford Hume. He was one of four people who worked on developing the first British hydrogen bomb. Oh, kind of like Oppenheimer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was right? just thinking of that. Yeah. Which eventually would be used during World War II. The Hume family was considered wealthy, especially for those times. Her family moved to New Zealand in 1948. 
And Juliet was hospitalized in 1953 for tuberculosis. She was treated for four months oh, man. and then discharged. But she would end up dealing with the effects of that her whole life. Juliet's father chose to relocate his family to Christ Church, New Zealand, after accepting a position as first rector at Canbury University College. Hmm. This position was sort of the president of the college, and he was ultimately responsible for running the whole college, the whole institution. The whole kit yeah, caboodle. like it's a big deal. That's yeah. why he moved. Juliet grew up in an entirely different world than Pauline did. She had horses. Nice. And, like I said, upper class family. Her mother was an aristocrat and immersed herself into the culture of other aristocrats to keep up appearances. Mm. We're talking way more high class than yeah. you and I. <laughs> exactly. I don't I, have that kind of money. No. <laughs> I'm not hanging out at country clubs. Nope. And, nope. No. Going to balls Especially or whatever they when do it nowadays. Was, when I was young. No. Yeah. I was going to Kmart to get my clothes. <laughs> exactly. Together, Henry and Hilda raised their two children, Julia and her brother, Jonathan, in a 16 what? bedroom <laughs> stone mansion. Damn. Nice. On Tons of acres of land. Nice. 16. 16. Who cleans that house? Not Mrs. Hume. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Like, what the hell? Do you You'd probably have a staff. I'm like, what the? Okay. Like Downton Abbey. Right, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not judging. Even though Juliet and Pauline were from very different backgrounds, they clicked as soon as they met one another. And besides their upbringings, the two girls were also opposite in their physical appearance. So Pauline, she was very small in stature. She stood five foot three inches tall, which is my height. It's not that small. Well, yeah. I don't like. I don't like being. It's not small. Five four is average. Five four is average. Mm -hmm. mm. It's just a little tinier. <laughs> dark hair and a very, very mean temper. Uh oh. Oh shit. Juliet was very tall for age. She was described as beautiful. Had shoulder length, light brown hair. She was considered very pleasant, and she spoke with a British accent. Nice. Nice. Pauline was known to have very dark, very cold eyes. Because she's me. Yeah, exactly. Some people described her as looking dead inside, and she was considered to look dumpy. Oh. But they quickly became friends. Like teenage girls do, I guess. Yeah, well, I, don't yeah, know. I don't know. Okay. Well, she's, I mean, think about it. Juliet is new in That's town. That's true. So they became friends quickly after the Hume family located to Christchurch. One of the things the two girls bonded over was their medical conditions. And that makes sense since they both struggled with their health. They attended the same school, Christchurch Girls High School, and they quickly got to know each other. They usually hung out in gym class. Oh, I hated gym class. I hated it. I hated it too. I hated it. I liked dodgeball, though. Yeah, dodgeball was fun. If you can dodge a wrench, <laughs> you can dodge a ball. I don't think they play dodgeball in schools anymore. No, probably not. Anyway, since Juliet's father was a highly admired physicist, they could afford what most families couldn't, as I already you know, told you. Pauline spent most of her time with Juliet at the Hume home, and one of the reasons was because Juliet had her own pony. Nice. Nice. Do you ever see that Seinfeld episode? Which one? Where he talks about, like, who grows up with a pony? I saw all of them. I just don't <laughs> and the, remember. And the, the lady was like, I had a pony. Well, I and didn't. she gets all upset. I didn't have a Like, back pony. in Europe when she was a little girl. Yeah. Okay, so she had a pony. Yeah. Pauline, with her medical condition, couldn't be as active. You know, she had this limp uh, as other girls her age. So she would ride Juliet's pony Aww. and it made her feel better. Yeah. Oh, she's out and about on the pony. Pauline's limp. It didn't have any effect on her when she's on a saddle, right? Yeah, really. So, and Pauline tried really hard to get her parents to allow her to keep a pony. <laughs> and she really wanted to be part of the horse and pony club. But her parents were like, uh, no, 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 no pony you're for not you. getting a pony. What her parents didn't know was that Pauline already had a pony. She did. <laughs> She kept it hidden away. I can't believe this. How do you hide a pony? Behind a padlock shed. And she had it for weeks. 
I don't know how she got the I goddamn mean, pony. I mean, like feeding it and just shoveling its shit. Like, what is she doing with it? She's hiding a pony. I don't know. How do you hide I don't, a fucking whole I, ass I, pony? I don't know. Man, okay. good for her, I guess. I don't even know how she got a pony. I know. Where did she get it from? Well, I do know. Pauline had purchased the pony with the advice of Juliet, and nobody knows exactly where she got the money from, but... Oh. I have a feeling I Juliet have a fe- gave yes, it to her. Exactly. This type of sneakiness was common with Pauline. I oh, mean, that's no. a little over the top. I, I, I feel like I'd know there was a pony there, but I, I know, might not. Right? I don't know. Not. I don't Who know. Knows? She was known to sneak out of her house into boys' bedrooms oh. during the middle of the night. I mean. Oh, Pauline. You probably have before, too. <laughs> At least you wanted to. At least I wanted to. Regardless, her parents, they knew how conniving their daughter was, which is why they became really worried when Pauline became so preoccupied with Juliet. Eventually, her parents did find out about the pony. Oh, they did. Okay. But when they found out, they let her keep it since she'd already had it so long. (laughs) Well, okay. You can keep the pony. I mean, doesn't it take, I don't know, the upkeep? I don't don't know. Don't they shit all over? Yes, that's what I'm saying. They, I'm, I mean, I've never had a pony. I don't know. The vet appointments for my tiny Yorkies. Yes, exactly. Like, I'm know, thinking, pony. like, it's know. eating a lot and shitting a lot. I don't, I don't know. know. Anyway, Does make, okay. Doesn't it make nay sounds? Yeah. I don't know. Let's just go Maybe on. Maybe it was a small, tiny pony. I don't know. A miniature pony would be cool. Yeah. Would. All right. Anyway. Anyway, we're, we're digressing. Mm-hmm. They knew that if they didn't let her keep the pony, she would metaphorically... Burn the house to the ground. Mm, she'd be pissed. Super pissed. She'd yeah. be pissed. And they just didn't want to deal with it. While Pauline and Juliet's friendship seemed relatively innocent to the outside world, the girls' bond got very dark very quickly. Oh. They had very intense imaginations, let's just say. As they began to grow closer and closer, they began to create this makeup world called the fourth world. Okay. They even invented a religion where they would appoint famous celebrities to be the saints of their religion. Did I list any of them? Mm -mm. Okay. It was like Orson Welles, James Mason, and many other popular. Yeah. Some of the saints, I mean, it was back in the day where Orson Welles, James Mason, other, I don't know, randomly famous people we wouldn't know very much about now. But back in the time, I guess they were hot. I don't know. (laughs) Many kids with wild imaginations have, like, imaginary friends, okay, but they're getting a little bit old for that. And they had entire backstories. They let their imagination run wild. And they got more and more immersed into this fantasy world. Juliet and Paul even even wrote stories that were set in the fourth world together. Oh. And that's okay. Yeah. They got nothing else going on. Right. There's no internet. No. (laughs) You see, they got a lot of time on their hands. They got a lot of time on their hands. They had the goal of becoming distinguished authors that would eventually get their stories published. Hmm. Who knows? The friendship between Juliet and Pauline became more like an obsession with one another. And although many friends do become obsessed with each other and maybe even consider themselves soulmates or sisters, nothing compares to the shit that transpired between the brains of these two. These girls would become physically ill when they were apart. Okay, that's a little weird. That's strange. I mean, I love you to die. I know, but, but I not, don't get sick when I don't see yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. It hurts a little, but I don't get sick. I would compare their friendship to an addict, like going through withdrawals when they weren't around okay, each other. Okay, that's so weird. Yeah, they were like drugs to each other. They became each other's entire world. And when they were together, they had that made-up realm. And they grew more and more distant from reality so if they don't have each other then they don't have that new reality they created and they're lost in real world both sets of parents became very worried about their daughters and since this case took place in the mid-1950s the parents were really more concerned that their daughters might be lesbians oh okay they were thinking okay Hmm. and that would be Horrible. Yeah, that would be a horrible mm. existence, right? Yeah, during the, that time in New Zealand, homosexuality was considered a sign of mental illness. Oh. And it was actually punishable with a felony. Are you kidding? No. Wow. The girls were accused of being in the same-sex relationship constantly. And we will circle around to this a little later. Their parents got concerned. They're spending every day, all day, 
just with each other, like nobody else. And Pauline's parents were very worried since now Pauline's 16 and she was doing very bad in school, like her grades dropped and they thought it was because of Juliet. Pauline's father said his daughter kept him totally out of her life, which Aww. I mean, my 15 year old does. Yeah, right. That's true. Some kids do do that. Parents are uncool. While she lived at home, she would go out of her way to blatantly ignore her parents because oh. teenagers are assholes. Right, exactly. She and Julia apparently had better things to do, <laughs> and they were always writing about their new fantasy world. Pauline's father wanted to spend time with his daughter so badly. I get it. I get mm-hmm. it. But she don't care. You're uncool. Her, was it Herbert? She don't care, Herbert. You're yeah. uncool. Mm-mm. She's 16. Let it go. She did share the stories that she wrote, and he was excited for her. He just wanted to connect with her in any possible way he could. This is like when my daughter talks about K-pop. Oh, she Lord. she knows, like, all the groups. She knows all their mm-hmm. names, and she'll tell me all about it, and which is cool. But I don't remember their names. And, oh, yeah. Okay, good. Know, I don't she, want you to. She goes into it a lot. Yeah, She's well, obsessed right now. Pauline once got so excited about what she was writing, she blurted out to him that she was writing an opera. Oh, what? what? <laughs> an opera? And it was really rare, and he was really happy because she was opening up to him. He was just looking for any crime. No, you're writing an opera? Oh, that's awesome. Do, do, do you know music? Yeah, do you? Do you know anything? Do they even sing in English? I don't know. I don't. Maybe I'm being I don't know. uneducated here. All Pauline's parents wanted was to have a happy family and a happy home. They wanted their children, both, their, all their children, to do wonderful things. At one point, Pauline's mother took her to meet a psychologist, though. I mean, you still got that lesbian thing yeah, right. worried about. His name was Dr. Bennett, and she wanted Pauline to talk about her friendship with Juliet. Pauline's mother told the doctor that her daughter needed to leave the high school. She needed to get away from Juliet. I don't think Pauline feels that way. No. And she thought her daughter would do better if their friendship had some time apart. Pauline, to her mother's surprise, agreed. Okay. What? Yeah. One day, Juliet's father called the Parker household to let him know that he was leaving New Zealand and he was going to take Juliet with him. She's out. Herbert and Honora were so Happy yeah, to hear that right? Juliet's getting the fuck out of town. <laughs> there was light at the t- end of the tunnel for them. But for Pauline, this meant that her entire world was going to crumble to pieces. So even though she agreed, she didn't really, I right. don't think, plan on it. Yeah, Mom, I'm not going to use my cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can trust me. Yeah. I won't mm-hmm. talk to her or text anybody. No, no, no. So it's 1954. Juliet's parents made the decision to get a divorce. Oh, And even though this wasn't the reason behind the separation. Like the girl's relationship? mm -hmm, This seemed to be a simple solution to end the obsessive relationship between Pauline and Juliet. It must be really bad. Yeah. Just to give you some background into the lives of Juliet's parents during this time. Henry worked, as I told you, as the rector of Canterbury University College at Christchurch. And soon after he got that position, another Englishman named Walter Andrew Bowman Perry arrived at Christchurch, New Zealand. After the arrival of Walter, the relationship and marriage between Henry and Hilda was never the same. Uh Uh-oh. Henry was making really good money as a rector of the university, and Walter was an engineer. He was a charmer, and he was actually in New Zealand for just a prolonged business trip. Walter and Henry both were deeply into the studies of sociology And Walter actually promised that he would work as a mediator and a marriage counselor for Henry and Hilda. Oh, that's so nice. It's so nice. (laughs) To work with the two of them so closely, Walter was invited to move in. What? Oh, they have 16 bedrooms, I guess. They have 16 bedrooms. Come on in and help us with our marriage. Sure. Okay. A stranger. And he agreed. At the beginning of his counseling, even though he... I, I don't know that I don't he think is. he's a counselor. He's not yeah. a marriage <laughs> An official counselor. counselor. Henry, Hilda, and Walter, they were all close friends. They were all from England, and it was nice to have someone that understood the culture right. and all of that. So they have this fellow Englishman living with them. So what I mean, what could possibly go wrong? What Their marriage is on the rocks, <laughs> and they've got um, a not-marriage counselor counseling them and... 
for the marriage living with them. Yeah. I don't see any mm. problems. But oh, sure, none. There's going to be a surprise. <laughs> One day, Juliet decided that she was done horseback riding and she wanted to sell her horse. Walter heard that she wanted to sell her horse and he offered to buy it from his new little friend, even though he's only on a business trip. I don't know. So Juliet walked in to talk to him about it later. Okay. And yeah, she found her mom and Walter having sex in bed. Oh, shit. Juliet found them? My bad. Wow. Damn. That's gotta be. Oh, that's fucked up. A little up. bit hard. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, Henry found out and he resigned yeah. from his position so he could go back to England. He'd been asked for some time to go back to England, so he knew he had a job there working on atomic research. Yeah. Hydrogen bombs. Hydrogen bombs. Henry was going to take Jonathan with him, and, you know, that's Juliet's brother. brother. Yeah. And leave Juliet with her mother. The air in England wasn't good for Juliet's lungs because, remember, she... Oh, she had tuberculosis. Yes. That's right. Yeah, especially in the winter months. The Hume family was also concerned with the fact that the daughter had become so close to dumpy Parker girl. <laughs> Is that what they called her? Yeah. Now, the two girls, Pauline and Juliet, were concerned over how their parents felt about their relationship because they fantasized in their novels or whatever you want to Yeah, whatever you, you want, want to call, call it, them. their writings or whatever. Yeah, that they're going to America. They idealized the American dream because they saw the movies. Yeah. And they wanted it for themselves. Everyone knew that those girls were determined to get their way any way they could. And everybody knew, as I've said, their friendship was unhealthy. They just didn't know how. how. <laughs> right. Oh, no. On more than one occasion, Henry made calls to Herbert discussing the friendship. And they had a plan that would separate the girls before they had a chance to embarrass the family. Embarrass the family. So the dads are plotting to separate them? Henry told Juliet he had an idea of taking her and her brother to South Africa. Oh, nice. I don't know what happened to England. Maybe for a vacation or something. For a vacation. But she could return without Jonathan to New Zealand to stay with her mother if that's what she wanted. There was a lot of tension that was noticed between the 46-year-old father and his 15-year-old daughter because she's only 15. The two had an unspoken understanding of the affair that was going on with Hilda and Walter. So apparently she didn't tell him. Oh, really? But somehow he knew. Somehow he knew. And they just kind of, that was the elephant yeah. in the room. Henry just knew. His kids knew oh. by the look in their eyes. That's got to be hard. And Juliet wasn't really good at hiding her emotions. If her mouth didn't say it, her face surely did. She probably was like when Walter came in the room like, Nyeh. Yeah. <laughs> It's my guess. <laughs> Regardless of the tension, neither one of them mentioned why any of this was happening to their family. Juliet reacted to her father's request to go to South Africa by saying, Pauline has to come with me. Okay, well, that makes sense. Henry said, you know, Pauline tagging along, that's out of the question. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but Juliet wasn't taking no for an answer. After this, Pauline and Juliet went to speak to Honora, and she agreed wholeheartedly with Henry and said that it's just, no, Pauline is not going to South Africa. Oh, maybe they were trying to convince her so that she could yeah. convince Henry. Right. Honora's decision made the girls really angry, and their anger transformed into a plan to kill. What? Pauline's mother. Oh, dang. But the two discussed the plans, and they were really enthusiastic. <laughs> You would honestly, you would have thought they were planning a surprise party. Oh my God. Pauline kept a diary, and the contents would be heard as evidence when eventually there was a trial. And in it, she didn't use real names. She didn't use her own name. Juliet was written under her pet name of Deborah. Deborah. And Pauline was referred to as Gina. Okay. Oh, that's so sneaky. And no one will ever figure it out, right? <laughs> The code. Yes. And wait till you hear clips of this diary. So now we're at June 22nd, 1954. It's a gloomy winter day, just on the outskirts of Christchurch. Today was actually the first day of winter for New Zealand. Juliet and Pauline chose to invite Honora out with them to Victoria Park. And that is in a place called 
Cashmere Hills. Sounds lovely. I know. They stopped at a tea shop for a little bit. Let's get some tea. Yeah. And when they were done, they headed down a path further into the park. All three women were bundled up because it's the first day of winter. Juliet needed to get out of the sights of Pauline and Honora to achieve the next stages of her plan. So she hurried around the bend in this path so no one could see her scattering the pebbles. I mean, these rocks weren't that big. Yeah. I mean, she has a whole bunch in her hands. They're not that big. Pauline was unable to hurry ahead with Juliet since she had to walk with that limp. Oh, that's So she stayed at her mom's side. But Pauline, like Juliet, was hiding something in her coat pocket. Uh Uh-oh. Half a brick. Oh, shit. Yeah. Juliet had brought the brick from her house three hours earlier and gave it to Pauline. After she was given this brick, which would be used as a murder weapon, Pauline placed the brick into the foot of one of her old socks. That way, when she swung it... Oh, no. You know, she could swing it. you could swing it, right. Right, and bludgeon her mom. But before I tell you more, we're going to take a quick break. Juliet was still about 60 yards ahead of Pauline and Honora when a small pink pebble caught Honora's eye. Oh. So that's why she had these pebbles. They were colorful. Yeah. Pauline played along and told her mom, oh, look at how beautiful it is. When Honora bent down, pick it up. Oh. Pauline was standing behind her mother. She pulled out the brick from her pocket in the sack, stood steadily, and swung the brick onto her mother's head. Oh. The brick crashed into Honora's head. She immediately fell to the ground, and blood began pouring out of her head. But it was too late for Pauline to stop, so she just kept swinging and swinging and swinging over and over again, hitting her mom's head. Juliet sprinted back to them after the first blow and kneeled beside Pauline's mother. From that position, she took the brick from Pauline and just started hitting Honora's head again and again and again. Together, Pauline and Juliet killed Honora. Oh, that's terrible. Blood poured out of 24 blows to her head and her face. Oh, no. It was destroyed. Oh, no. Once they realized what actually happened, the two teen girls began to cry. Oh, come on. Uncontrollably. And they just looked at each other and at the woman they just killed in cold blood. They're watching as Honora's blood is just trickling down her face down to the path. The plan wasn't complete, though. The girls had decided to make Honora's death look like an accident. Oh, okay, sure. (laughs) She's been smashed in the face 24 times, but it was, oops, accident. They were covered in blood as they ran 400 yards back to where they had tea. When the two sobbing girls re-entered the restaurant or tea shop, Pauline screamed to the owner, It's mummy. Do you like that accent? I do. She went on to say that her mother was in a terrible condition and they both said, Oh, I think she's dead. They tried to carry her, but she was just too heavy. Juliet blurted out, Yes, it's her mother, as her voice was cracking through the tears. She just said, she's covered with blood. The shop owner asked where Honora was, and Pauline pointed down the path in the direction of where her mom's body was. As Pauline pointed, the shop owner, her name was Agnes Ritchie, noticed that Pauline had blood splatter on her face. On her face? Oh, no. And Pauline could see the look in Agnes's eyes and said, please don't make us go down there again. Pauline went on to explain that the three of them were coming back from wherever they were, and her mother tripped on a plank of wood and hit her head. <laughs> this is the plan. This Teenagers is the story. Are stupid. Yeah, I told stupid. you that. The police were called, and other people showed up, and they saw Honora. It was obvious she'd been beaten to death. So Pauline had to improvise. She went on to explain that her mother just kept falling. <laughs> And kept banging her head and whacking her face on the ground Mm -hmm. as she fell. Come on now. You fall on your face when you're sober? Over Over, and over and over? Over. over. I mean, maybe once. Yeah, maybe. But not over and over. Not 24 times. I have on my face. (laughs) And Julia jumped in and tried to make Pauline's story, you know, more believable, saying, I'll always remember her head banging. Mm. Agnes went ahead and she called her husband. And she told the girls to use the sink to wash the blood off. 
Agnes remembered hearing Pauline and Juliet laughing oh. hysterically as they walked off Honora's blood from them. Kenneth, who is Agnes's husband, he sprinted down the path, and I think this is actually before the police came, where Pauline had pointed to and he found Honora. She was under a tall pine tree laying on a bed of pine needles near the path. After seeing her, Kenneth sprinted back to the shop to call the police. As I said, when the police and the ambulance arrived, it was like, hello, like she did not just fall. They ended up putting Pauline and Juliet in the police vehicle, and Honora's body was taken away. A medical examiner actually accounted a total of 45 oh. separate wounds. So some of them weren't to the face and head, oh, only yeah. 24. Okay. Unfortunately for the girls, no one bought their... Bullshit. Bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> and they were charged with murder. After they were arrested, it didn't take long for these girls to confess. And the trial took place three weeks later. That's fast. Yeah. Maybe that's a prelim. Yeah, maybe. How could it be? Juliet told this detective, Detective Brown, that she gave the brick to Pauline and that she knew that she put it in a sock. She claimed she didn't know what was going to happen. Right. With a brick in a sock. Yeah. Oh, no. I don't know what's going to happen. And that Pauline was going to use it to frighten her mother. So she'd allow them to go to South Africa. Really? Really? I got a brick here. If you don't you let me go. You better let me go. Really. She then said that she saw Pauline hit her mother with a brick. And she took the brick and hit Honora. Juliet said that as soon as she saw Pauline with a first strike against her mom, she knew they had no choice but to kill her. She ended the confession with the fact that she was just so terrified. Really? Mm -hmm. Pauline was the next one to be interrogated by investigators. She blurted out, I killed my mother. <laughs> well, there you, well, there there you, you go. go. All right. That didn't take long. She confessed that she'd made the decision to kill her a few days earlier. She told detectives that she had no idea how many times she struck her mother, but it had been many, many times. While Pauline and Juliet were in custody, Juliet's father, Henry, left to go back to England to start his new job. Oh, shit, he left? He left. Well, she's arrested? And he took her brother, Jonathan, with him. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm outie. Yeah. The funeral for Honora took place, and Honora was buried in Christ Church Cemetery. The only parents left in the area were Pauline's father, Herbert, and Juliet's mother, Hilda. While Herbert was falling apart internally, Hilda, she was calm, cool, collected, she had to keep up those appearances because remember, oh, she's an aristocrat. Right. And she chose to do so with her new man, Walter. <laughs> Walter. <laughs> by her side. Walter must be fabulous. That's oh, all I have to say. Geez. I thought he was only staying there for a little I while. Know. What happened? Herbert had to take the stand, and he only needed to speak on two things. The boy that Pauline was seeing and how his daughter and Juliet were in such good spirits on the day of his wife's murder. Because remember, she used to sneak into boys' rooms. Yeah, that's right. And she was in really good spirits the day her mom yeah. got murdered. So how could she have possibly murdered I'm, her when she was so happy? When she was so happy. This murder took New Zealand by storm. And, you know, everybody was paying attention. It was a notorious event. The trial drew a very large crowd. But, but it was only crowded until the local rugby team's match started. <laughs> That was the thing to do until rugby season? Rugby in this region of the world is like NFL in America. Uh, it's the equivalent to some people's religion. It's like soccer in Europe. Yeah. And everybody eats, sleeps, and breathes rugby. So the case was huge for a time. And then, you know, rugby started. <laughs> but there's one piece of evidence that was a focal point for the trial. Pauline's diary. Oh, yeah. The contents of the diary along with the medical evidence, I mean, to me, I mean, hello, it's, it's mm -hmm. all pretty clear, were what was used to find out the pressing question, were Julia and Pauline of sound mind? Nobody knew. Hmm. Prosecutor thought they were completely rational and that they were just demented, and the motive for the murder was crystal clear to him. The prosecutor told the 12 jurors, you look at them and you think they're just too teenage girls, but don't have any pity on them, as he described everything that happened. And then he presented the diary that was discovered in Pauline's bedroom. The jury was utterly astounded at the thoughts that were written down about these 16-year-old girls and what was in their head. 
Through the trial, the girls tried to chat quietly, but they always had somebody sit between them. They're like, hey, yeah, your hair looks good today. <laughs> so I'm going to read you part of the some of the infamous lines of Pauline's diary that she wrote February 13th, 1954. It's a Saturday. She said, quote, I felt depressed at the thought of the day. There seemed to be no possibility of mother relenting and allowing me to go. She's most unreasonable. I also overheard her making insulting remarks about Mrs. Hume while I was ringing this afternoon. I was livid. I'm very glad the Humes sympathize with me, and it's nice to feel adults realize that what mother is. Why could not mother die? Dozens of people are dying all the time, thousands. So why not mother and father too? Life is very hard. Damn. She lumped her dad in there too? Yeah. <laughs> Then on April 28th, this is a Wednesday, she wrote, Mother went out this afternoon, so Deborah and I bathed for some time. Yeah. And Deborah is Juliet, and they used to bathe together. However, I felt thoroughly depressed afterwards and even quite seriously considered suicide. Life seemed so much not worth the living, and death was such an easy way out. Anger against Mother boiled up inside me, as it was she who was one of the main obstacles in my path. Suddenly, a means of ridding myself of this obstacle occurred to me. If she were to die, I spent the evening writing, and I managed to finish my chapter. The next day, she wrote, I did not tell Deborah, slash Juliet, of my plans for removing mother. I have made no definitive plans yet. I'm trying to think of some way. I do not want to go to too much trouble, but I want it to appear either natural or accidental. Oh, her mom's death. Yes. Yeah. Lastly, in that day's excerpt, she spoke about how she thought of murdering her mother, and it never upset her. She asked herself if she was peculiar for feeling <laughs> that way. Yes. A Hudley, Pauline, and Juliet used the term moiter rather than murder in the diary. Oh, that was their code word? Yeah. They thought it was really clever. You know, no one will understand what moiter means. The next day, a diary passage was presented to the jury from June 21st. It's a Monday. Says, quote, I rose late and helped mother vigorously this morning. Deborah slash Julia rang, and we decided to use a rock and a stocking rather than a sandbag. We discussed the moiter fully. Oh. I feel very keyed up, as though I were planning a surprise party. And that was the day of before the murder. the murder. Mother's fallen in with everything beautifully, and the happy event is to take place tomorrow. The happy event? So next time I write in this diary, mother will be dead. How odd. Yet how pleasing. Wow. The next page is the next day, and it's titled The Day of the Happy Event. <laughs> wow. Bitch. I'm writing a little of this up in the morning before the death. I feel very excited. And the night before Christmas-ish was last night. Oh, she was like giddy like it's yeah. before Christmas? I did not have pleasant dreams, though. I am about to rise. What a little psycho. Yeah. What the fuck is that? So that was all read to the jury. Then, you know, the defense is all trying to talk about how Pauline was bedridden as a child. And there were psych evaluations brought in. This doctor, Dr. Medlicott, he came in and he testified. He spoke to both girls. And he testified that the diary, what was given to him, Speaking to the girls and reading the diary, that's pretty much all he needed to give an assessment. He concluded that both girls thought they lived in a make-believe world called the Fourth Realm and that the higher power of God and those saints, oh, yeah, like Orson Welles, right. yeah, like Orson Welles. <laughs> were more powerful than any human god and that they had heightened powers. He concluded that both girls had a lot of arrogance, but Pauline did show some signs of remorse. But usually she only felt it when she was trying to sleep. Oh, she yeah, couldn't fall asleep. asleep. Hmm. She's a little, I don't know, anxious. She said every time that she would try to fall asleep, on her left side, her mother would appear Oh, on her right side. <laughs> okay. What the fuck is that? Both girls said we're not crazy, we knew what we were doing, and that the rest of the world was out of their minds. Oh. Okay. It's everybody else. It's everybody else. Yes. Pauline had also written in her diary how excited she and Juliet were about their next idea. They were going to figure out how much money a typical sex worker made. Oh. So they could join that field. Okay. Because they wanted money, and they wanted to get money from men for sex. And then Dr. Medley Cott also said that when Pauline did see a boy, she regularly visited this boy named Nicholas, it made Juliet jealous. 
Dr. Malikha answered that the girls were crazy and they suffered from a type of insanity in which individuals share the same delusion or false belief. Pauline's family doctor then took the stand. His name was Dr. Bennett. He agreed that both girls had the same delusional beliefs. He also stated that both girls seemed to suffer from paranoia and they were antisocial and very dangerous. Right. They thought they were better than the human race. They didn't want any more nagging parents. Nobody does. <laughs> and then Dr. Bennett mentioned the fact that the girls bathed together, slept together, played dress up together, played make believe together, created a cemetery together, oh. and even held a funeral for a dead mouse and buried the mouse with a cross headstone. Girls ended up being examined four times, and in the end, it was determined they didn't have any mental defects. They knew what they were doing, and they knew what was wrong. They were above average intelligence, and it was concluded that the girls were actually engaging in a homosexual relationship. Oh. When closing arguments came about, the girls were laughing as the jury returned with a verdict. Oh, no. The verdict of guilty. Then they stopped laughing. <laughs> They were sentenced to detention during Her Majesty's pleasure, a sentence for any convicted person under the age of 18 years of age. I guess it's at their own discretion, yeah. pleasure, a sentence. I don't know. They basically were to be imprisoned at the yeah the judge's discretion. I don't want to tell you how much they, time they served. How much? Five years. Oh, my God. But they weren't kept in the same prison. Oh. While in separate prisons, they formed their own separate lives. They were forbidden to contact each other, so they drifted apart. Pauline eventually changed her name to Hillary Nathan, and she lives in the UK, a very private life. Her older sister, Wendy, has said that she does not have any contact with the outside world, and she deeply regrets killing her mother. On the other hand, Julia lived out all her dreams that she and Pauline had together. There was a movie called Heavenly Creatures, and it was about these girls. Mm -hmm. The reporters were able to track Juliet down, and they were astounded to find out that she'd made quite a life for herself as a best-selling author for murder mystery novels <laughs> Get under out of the here. name Anne Perry. Oh, no, I'm going to have to read one of them. What? The what? Fuck she, I know she that? made she made murder mysteries. What the fuck is that? She was asked about her past with Pauline, and she said that she doesn't dwell on the past because she would end up tormenting herself which really wouldn't help. Juliet passed away in April of this year at the age of 84. To this day, the murder of Honora Reber is still considered to be the worst crime committed in Zealand's history. Damn. And that's our story. Wow, Talia. That was crazy. Yeah. Teenagers. Yeah. Man, I was a horrible teenager. Man, I didn't kill my mother, though. No, I didn't either. Yeah. Maybe wanted to. I didn't. No. So I want to thank you guys all for taking the time to listen to this episode of Crimes and Consequences. If you like this, you can hit the subscribe or follow button. You can also get unreleased episodes only for exclusive members at patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, like Dynamite TNT Crimes. You can go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. And if you're listening on Apple, go ahead and just go to the Apple Podcast and app and click subscribe. You get a uh, on release episode every week, you get all these episodes ad free and early. And I gotta go, Tanya. I know, we got a boogie. All right, well, thanks everyone. Until our next episode, don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.